Hello everyone. Thanks for joining me in this video. I'm Frank. In this video, I will present the results of a study that we've carried out in an Archean greenstone belt with airborne hyperspectral imaging and field follow-up. The talk focuses on hyperspectral detection of hydrothermal alteration, potential association with early life environments, and field follow-up to solve ambiguities in the interpretation. I gave the same presentation during the annual meeting of the Geological Remote Sensing Group, GRSG, of the Geological Society of London, which took place in December 2022 in the Netherlands at the faculty of ITC of the University of Twente. Okay, so the title, Hyperspectral Imaging of Early Earth Hydrothermal Processes. Um, my co-authors are listed here as well. Uh, Kim Hein, Emeritus uh, Professor at Witwatersrand University in South Africa. Islam Fadel, a uh, colleague, geophysicist at the uh, University of Twente. And uh, Lexi Tendai Rubaba, an MSc student from Zimbabwe, who did her uh, uh, MSc research on, uh, on this topic. So it is about hydrothermal processes in the Archean. Uh, the importance is, uh, of these processes is twofold. First of all, formation, uh, they are linked to the formation of uh, mineral deposits. And second, uh, they're also linked to emergence of life. Um, a popular hypothesis is that uh, early life may have emerged and thrived near submarine hydrothermal vents and subaerial uh, geysers. Uh, <coughs> amongst other environments. Uh, this is uh, according to Westall, paper of Westall uh, from 2018. Um, and uh, hydrothermal processes, uh, they are thought to, uh, to play a key role in providing suitable chemical and physical environments. So hydrothermal processes, they play a role, um, presumably uh, in the emergence of life and therefore um, yeah, it's logical to use hyperspectral remote sensing to study uh, the, uh, the early life environments yeah, because hyperspectral remote sensing is good at uh, detection of hydrothermal minerals. So the aim of this study is, uh, is shown here. It's to find indications of paleo-hydrothermal processes in a paleo-Archean greenstone belt in the Pilbara Craton in Western Australia and to explore links with early life environments in this greenstone belt using hyperspectral techniques. Um, the reason for the study area, uh, one of the greenstone belts in the, uh, in the Pilbara Craton, is, um, well, it basically came out of a uh, reconnaissance trip in 2003 that I did together with uh, Kim Hein, and where we, uh, in this area, we discovered this, uh, this vent structure that you see here. Uh, well, what you see here on the left is a chert layer, uh, a subvertical chert layer. You can see that here. Uh, and on the, on the left of it is uh, the hanging wall. And on the, uh, on the right is the foot wall. And what you see here in this foot wall is this, uh, this reddish outcrop, yeah, which is uh, a gossan. Um, yeah, so we interpreted this as a paleo surface, and uh, when we took a closer look at this gossam, we could see uh, interesting textures, uh, concentric circular textures that you can see here in the, in the middle, but also in the, in the right-hand uh, photo. And um, we thought that they may uh, represent uh, early life uh, fossils, yeah, which are about 3.46 uh, billion years old, uh, because that's the age of this uh, um, of this section of the, of the greenstone belt. And then why using hyperspectral remote sensing? Well, that goes back to uh, a paper that we have written uh, in the past uh, about another uh, greenstone belt. And um, what we found there is that uh, with infrared spectroscopy and hyperspectral remote sensing, we can see expressions of, of um, fossil hydrothermal uh, alteration systems and that we can use these expressions, yeah, which are different types of, uh, of white mica, basically, to reconstruct fluid pathways. Um, and, and basically, the system that we, uh, that we were looking uh, at there is, uh, is a paleo surface, yeah, like this. Yeah, so in the past, uh, in Archean times, with uh, a seafloor um, and uh, with volcanic rock and intrusions in the in the seafloor um, where 
because of uh, heat in the crust, uh, hydrothermal fluid circulation or fluid convection took place. Um, and at sites where these, uh, these fluids discharged, at hydrothermal vent sites, um, VMS, so volcanic hosted massive sulfides, uh, copper zinc deposits were formed. And as well in these uh, hydrothermal vent structures, uh, micro fossils were, were found. Yeah, so that shows that uh, with hyperspectral remote sensing, we can look at the, uh, the hydrothermal context of, uh, of discharge sites. And um, yeah, and that's a pretty efficient uh, way of, of studying these, uh, these, uh, these systems and yeah, the environments where early life may have uh, emerged or flourished. Um, this is, uh, well, on the right, it's uh, a Landsat color composite of Western Australia, and in the northwest uh, is the the Pilbara Craton is uh, positioned, uh, which has this very classic uh, appearance with um, oval bright uh, granitoid uh, complexes and in between uh, greenstone belts. Um, the uh, the system or the result that I just showed uh, from from uh, from these VMS uh, hydrothermal fluid cells. Um, they are positioned here uh, uh, in, in the Kangaroo Caves formation. And uh, in this study uh, that I'm going to present now, we're going to look at another greenstone belt uh, more to the, uh, to the east of, of this uh, formation, and which is also older. This shows um, a generalized stratigraphy of, uh, yeah, of, of the greenstone belt we're going to look at. That's basically covered uh, or called the Pilbara supergroup. Um, on the left here, you can see um, a standard uh, stratigraphic column with the Precambrian. And uh, you can see that uh, well, there are Archean rocks and there's a certain section, the Paleoarchean of 3.2 to 3.6 billion years old. Um, well, the stratigraphy in the Greenstone Belt we're studying, yeah, is of similar age, 3.2 to 3.5. Um, and this is, an, well, here the stratigraphic column is nicely uh, compiled by uh, Hickman in 2021, I think it was not 22. And uh, basically there are three formations or sections where um, early life fossils have been, been found and described. And the youngest is uh, the Kangaroo Caves uh, formation at the top. Uh, from which I just showed the example, around uh, 3.2 uh, uh, to 3.3 billion years old. And there we find micro fossils in, in chimney structures. And they're associated with uh, VMS hydrothermal systems. Um, Pirino uh, did an, uh, made a very nice uh, review of, of, of systems in, uh, in the Archean, uh, which, uh, from which the information here is, is obtained. Um, there's an older uh, formation which is called the Strelipool formation, yeah, about 3.4 million years old. And uh, yeah, people have described, described stromatolites there. And uh, yeah, the type of hydrothermal systems are generally considered to, to be low sulfidation. Um, and the oldest uh, in the Pilbara craton are uh, the oldest uh, indications of early life. They are found in the dresser formation um, yeah a bit older than the Strelipool formation and also their stromatolites were found um, and they're associated with high sulfidation uh, minerals okay uh, so that was the the context uh, a little bit about the methods uh, what have we uh, what kind of methods have we used? Uh, we've used compilation of previous work, including study of rock samples uh, from before 2004. Uh, University of Utrecht has done a lot of work in this, in this area, but they looked uh, mostly at uh, the structural geology uh, aspects and uh, there was no attention given to hydrothermal alteration or hydrothermal systems. Um, uh, so, but we used uh, some rock samples uh, from, from, from their studies, uh, geological maps, um, and also uh, archived airborne geophysics, which were not used by uh, uh, previous uh, researchers from, from Utrecht in the past. 
Um, we have also uh, acquired archived uh, airborne hyperspectral imagery from the AMS uh, sensor. It's a high map like sensor from 1998, four meter pixels. Uh, there was no shortwave infrared one sensor um, because, uh, well, apparently in order to get a better signal to noise ratio in this sphere two, uh, which is at the longer wavelength of the of the, the, the shortwave infrared, so up to two and a half uh, micrometers, and which was uh, flown by the Beers uh, for diamond exploration. And that also explains why they looked at the uh, the, the longer wavelength uh, range of the shortwave infrared because there that's the place where you find uh, magnesium hydroxyl features. Uh, those data we processed and interpreted. Uh, after the interpretation, we did field work follow up uh, to to solve ambiguities in the data and the interpretation. Uh, rock, we took rock samples, we imaged them uh, with a hyperspectral sensor and uh, additional laboratory analysis of rock samples was also uh, conducted. Yeah, this is all ongoing work, so uh, what I'm going to show you are intermediate results and not the end results of the study. So this is uh, basically the area that we have been investigating. Uh, the grid cell size here, uh, so the spacing between the, the vertical and horizontal lines is a kilometer. And uh, what we're looking at here is an aerial photo mosaic. And it, uh, well, this whole section uh, is tilted to, to sub-vertical. And, and what we're basically looking at is a cross-section through the Archean crust with the, with the bottom and here, and with the oldest rocks in this, uh, in this area, and the top with the younger rocks in this area. Huh? But they're all uh, Archean. Um, what you can see is... Uh, yeah, the bedding uh, of, of the different layers, um, yeah, which is from left to right, and there are different textures, so different rock units, and there are some indications of, uh, of faulting uh, also apparent. Um, but if we look at the, uh, the stratigraphy, yeah, so here again, I show the same st compiled stratigraphy by Hickman. And um, well, the, the rocks, uh, rock type here basically are different types of basalt. So we have the Euro, uh, Euro basalt, we have the Mount Ada basalt, and uh, the North Star uh, basalt. Um, and in between there's a duffer formation of uh, volcanic clastic uh, uh, material. And near the top of the duffer formation, that's where we expect the uh, Stralipool formation, yeah, which is uh, known to contain um, stromatolites in places and uh, there may be uh, some indication but we have to verify that of dresser formations uh, lower in the uh, volcanic sequence okay so we see some textures here and structures but but really uh, not a whole lot of information we can't see any information related to hydrothermal alteration for instance and that's why we use uh, uh, a mosaic of uh, of the hyperspectral airborne hyperspectral data from the AMS sensor, and uh, this is then what it looks like. Yeah, you can see uh, well what you see here is an airborne hyperspectral uh, image, and then um, yeah we created a wavelength map of this of the area. Um, well, at the back, yeah you can still see uh, some uh, some aerial photo through, and yeah, so we made it uh, semi-transparent. Uh, because that gives the best interpretable uh, picture. Um, so it's a wavelength map yeah, of uh, the deepest uh, absorption feature between uh, 2.1 and 2.4 micrometers. Yeah, you can see the legend here on the, on the lower right. Um, and um, well, it is the, this, the wavelength position is, is calculated by, by fitting a par parabola through the deepest feature, as you can see in the upper right. Um, and uh, the depth of the feature is uh, used to, uh, as an intensity layer. And you can also see that here in the, uh, in the legend. Um, how the intensity is, is uh, uh, related to, uh, to the depth. Now, what, what you see here is now an, a lot of variation, a lot of different colors uh, uh, indicating different types of, uh, of minerals. Yeah, that, that's clear. So we have here in this uh, lower section of the greenstone belt, uh, we see a lot of purplish colors, yeah, likely indicating magnesium hydroxyl uh, minerals, then orange colors 
um, more iron rich uh, hydroxyl uh, minerals. And above that, all these greenish uh, colors, which are in the range of, of yeah, aluminum hydroxyl, probably white micas. And then we have a few cyan, cyan pixels, which uh, indicate an, an even shorter uh, absorption wavelength um, related to other minerals. Uh, there's currently um, an MSC study by, by Ewald van Daal that's ongoing, who, is, uh, who has been imaging and studying yeah, rock samples from the old archives in the, uh, that were uh, taken from this area. And uh, well, he, he, he did detailed interpretation of hyperspectral, lab hyperspectral images of these rock samples. And it appears that, that the purplish colors are uh, mixtures basically of, of uh, amphiboles, uh, magnesium chlorides, pyroxene and carbonates. Yeah, so they are even at the hand specimen scale are difficult to, to, to separate all those. Um, the orange colors are basically uh, iron chlorides. Uh, the different shades of green are, are, are uh, white micas yeah, going from aluminium rich to aluminium poor composition. Um, okay, and, and the cyan colors, and it's not from his study because uh, yeah, the, the, the uh, the cyan colored pixels were not uh, present in the samples that he used, but those are uh, uh, pyrophyllite, uh, most likely. Now, if we look at, if we, if we evaluate the hyperspectral, uh, well, signatures, then um, we can confirm that, well, at least <laughs> when we look at the airborne data, it suggests it's pyrophyllite. Okay. Um, well, since we are interested in uh, early life environments, uh, so we want to, to, to see the, uh, the hydrothermal context and hyperspectral context of potential early life environments. Uh, we were initially interested in uh, interpreting paleo surfaces yeah, because those are the places, for instance, at, at the paleo seafloors, but also in, 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 in the shallow marine or, or uh, lacustrine conditions, we, we, we may expect to find, uh, for instance, stromatolites and other um, early life fossils. Um, yeah, so we, we looked at breaks in the, uh, in the mineralogy, um, potential chert layers, yeah, so where we find um, um, silicification and, and deposition of, uh, of hydrothermal uh, silica, that, that's the idea. Um, and, and also uh, areas where we find white micas in, in, in the foot wall, so just beneath these, these paleo surfaces. And then in this area, we could come up with uh, basically three, three potential paleo surfaces. The first one is here uh, near the top, uh, which is coinciding with uh, the, the Strelipool formation. Um, and the second one is here at the lower level, uh, where we, uh, we also find the, the sudden break in the mineralogy uh, with some more felsic or white mica minerals in the foot wall. And then the other one is here at uh, here in this zone here near the, near the bottom uh, where we basically find the same and where there are also rocks that are um, contemporaneous to the, uh, to the dresser formation. Okay, so those are basically our areas of interest that we wanted to further check in the, in the field to see if, if indeed there are paleo services and whether we can find the early life fossils. Um, yeah, so we defined four uh, different follow-up areas and I'll go first to, uh, to area A, then D and then C. Um, through C, there is this, uh, this fault zone and that was also interpreted from the hyperspectral data. I used another image for that, but I didn't have time while well, during the previous presentation to explain all that. So I'm just showing it here, but it has some uh, yeah, as well impact on, uh, on the, the area here. But we'll look at that later. Let's first go to uh, area A. Um, yeah, so uh, we took, uh, we, we rented a four wheel drive and then we uh, um, went to the field in uh, September, October uh, 2022. Um, this is what the area looks like. So it is uh, dry um, with uh, a lot of spinifex vegetation, which makes it uh, occasionally difficult to, uh, to, uh, 
to move through the area because of all these these things the the stings um, that it contains um it's hilly uh, so not everything is easily accessible it's very remote so we have to take safety precautions uh, for sure um, but the exposure is, is really really good yeah so um, there's not there is weathering but not too much uh, and uh, it's not covered by by, by other uh, younger sediments or so or hardly hardly covered so area a um, this is the uh, the wavelength image with the potential uh, paleo surfaces and uh, what you see here in below is um, this zone with cyan color so we think uh, we, we thought that uh, this this might be pyrophyllite and the greenish colors may uh, may be aluminium rich white micas and a couple of other col colors uh, uh, related to other rock types like 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 uh, mafic basalts etc um, so we collected rock samples at these uh, these yellow uh, dots and we imaged them in after our field trip in the uh, in our lab and then we came up with uh, with this um, let, let's first look at these these rocks here they were taken across this outcrop yeah, and two of them they, they have the same colors yeah, so they both contain uh, uh, pyrophyllite yeah so in the hand specimen we can clearly see that uh, yeah, when we look when we evaluate the reflector spectra so it has the right absorption wavelength position uh, absorption feature wavelength position but also if we look at the spectra this, this it's clearly pyrophyllite and then the, the greenish rock samples they um, they are aluminium rich white micas uh, some rock samples uh, they don't show any colors here and that's because they are either uh, well they have shallower absorption features and uh, depends on the stretch of which absorption features we see but they are in general uh, magnesium hydroxyl features and and some chert and we won't see them here um all right um yeah so we found pyrophyllite and aluminium rich white mica uh, pyrophyllite uh, is, is a typical mineral because it has a, a certain um, but formed under certain chemical conditions yeah, with uh, where the pH is low and uh, the, ba the, the the content of basic cations is, uh, is 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 also low and it has a specific temperature range. Yeah, so often this is then formed. Uh, uh, because of well, when there are fluids uh, which were derived from from magmatic uh, sources, um, often related to hydrothermal alteration, uh, yeah, in epithermal systems, high sulfidation epithermal systems. Um, okay, right. So, um, is this is a paleo surface. Well, let, let's have a look uh, on the ground, and I'll show you some field field photos. Well, this is this is what the the outcrop looks like yeah, it's a it's a schist it's a pyrophyllite schist so uh, it was formed in an uh, in a shear zone and if we look in the other direction we can see that it forms a ridge um, which is parallel to the stratigraphy and this is not a paleo surface but it's, uh, it's formed in a shear zone okay um, and the same applies for uh, yeah the uh, the other potential paleo surface in service more uh, a bit higher in the stratigraphy so i'm talking about this one okay uh, well let's then go to um, to section d um, again i show here a wavelength image but now the stretch is different so th and now oh, the colors only cover the wavelength uh, uh, range of, of white micas yeah so the the, the cyan and blue uh, colors they represent short wavelength aluminium rich white micas and the reddish to purple are long wavelength or more iron and magnesium rich uh, white micas um, well you can see the top of this uh, this sequence uh, which is uh, covered by this this paleo surface um, well we took uh, rock samples along transects represented by the ye yellow dots and there are two areas we're going to have a look at the uh, have, well, look at them a bit more closer um, in a second. Okay, but first have a look at. Uh, let's have a look at 
um, wavelength images of rock samples that we collected there and uh, you can see uh, similarities in wavelength position so going from top to bottom is here from top to bottom yeah so we see this variation in, in wavelength position of white micas these are all white micas um, uh, where the closer we you come to this interpreter paleo surface had uh, this reddish line the the shorter the wavelength positions become and above it you know we don't have much white micas uh, but more chert layers and some magnesium uh, iron magnesium uh, hydroxyl minerals um, and near the top we have some pyrophyllite but that's that is a different system we think um, now and the same we find basically in in the second transect going from here to here uh, going from here to here and uh, the third one third transect also shows the same with near this uh, paleo surface we have shorter wavelength white micas and when we go down in uh, lower into the the sequence we get the longer wavelength uh, white micas um yeah and these uh white mica alteration we can uh, well consider to be uh, a low sulfidation assemblage um okay so let's have a first have a look at this uh, yellow circle and uh, this is basically uh the, uh, the 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 location that I showed you before, yeah, where we interpret this, this paleosaur surface with potential uh, early life fossils. Yeah, within the foot wall, we have the aluminium rich white mica zones, and um, when we go further away from the uh, from the paleo surface, it becomes more aluminium uh, poor. Okay, uh, something more about these these textures. Um, in the other circle, more to the left, yeah, we find these uh, black quartz veins yeah, and that are associated with, with aluminum rich white mica altered uh, wall rock. Um, and these veins we can see in, in, the, in the foot wall yeah, of, this, uh, of this sequence. Um, but some also do cross-cut uh, chert layers. Okay, so, but then if we have a closer look at these, uh, these veins, we can see this, these, uh, well, concentric circular textures, and they look very much similar to this, uh, uh, the other uh, textures uh, near this vent structure that we interpreted as a vent structure. Okay, well, since these are relatively high temperature quartz veins, uh, we, we don't think that this can be of uh, biological origin, so we think it's... Uh, our interpretation basically is that it is chalcedony and it is uh, the result of abiotic uh, processes. Yeah, just uh, silica deposition by chemical processes. Um, okay, so that was here in, uh, in area D. Yeah, so yeah, we find this uh, more aluminium rich uh, white micas near this uh, uh, paleo surface. Also here near uh, veins, yeah, these black chert veins. And uh, the the, uh, the concentric circular textures, we think they are uh, abiotic. And let's now go to area C. Um, yep, this is uh, a close up. And uh, again, uh, the wavelength image is stretched uh, to only show uh, white mica minerals, and we can see basically a similar kind of. Uh, uh, association with the uh, the paleo horizon yeah? so the paleo surface here which is a chert layer and then we have the aluminium rich uh, micas here and then when we get this structural zone uh, so um, well from evidence in the field uh, it, it, it shows that it is a, a brittle fault and um, and then we have this uh, this section below which is uh, altered with, with a longer wavelength white mica well all along these uh, well we, we run four transacts here and we took samples and and, and also when we compared the uh, the lab hyperspectral images <coughs> with the airborne hyperspectral image we uh, we can see the same patterns yeah so the variation in white mica mineralogy is is confirmed in the field um, <coughs> but i'll show a few uh, photos of what this looks like um, yeah, so in here we find quite steep topography. 
and um, yeah, we find beautiful gorges here. And this is uh, my colleague Kim Hein admiring the geology in these uh, in these gorges, um, but which was occasionally difficult to uh, um, to go through. But uh, well, with some effort, we we, we managed. And this is uh, an outcrop which is called Dolomite Creek. And here we find the stromatolites, and this is basically what it looks like. And these are silicified units near the top of this, uh, this sequence. Uh, on close-up, they look like this. And what you see here are layered structures uh, with some curved surfaces. Um, they're silicified, and they are interpreted to be the result of uh, mats of uh, cyanobacteria. Um, yeah, there's diff it's difficult to uh, to explain these uh, these structures uh, using abiotic processes. Um, well, there have been some um, some studies of of, uh, of recent analogs of these bacterial mats, and the, the textures they they look really similar. So it's it's quite convincing, I must say. Although no organic molecules have been found in these stromatolites because they're all silicified. Um, if, you look a if you look closely at them, you can see that there are sand grains caught in, and that's also uh, typical of these, uh, these bacterial mats that they, they also capture sediments from, from uh, yeah, plastic sediments from uh, the water in which they're growing. Okay, um, so, these stromatolites are part of this, this unit, yeah, that, which is interpreted as a paleo surface near the top of the, uh, the sequence. And uh, this is a silicified, what's, it's a stromatolite uh, bearing a chert, so it's a silicified rock uh, potentially formed by uh, uh, silicification by hydrothermal, uh, hydrothermal uh, discharge uh, zones. The, the discharge silica. Um, okay, and um, this is uh, basically an, a unit that uh, covers uh, the top of area C from here. Well, we found it here, we found it here, and we found them here as well, and they continue towards the, the right. On uh, In this transaction, and more to the left, yeah, we did not find any indications of stromatolites. So, and, and, and given the, uh, the structural corridor, just in the, in the foot wall, um, that uh, separates this, this, this domain from the underlying domain, um, yeah, we, uh, well, we, we only know that this is an, a separate unit, um, yeah, which is stromatolite bearing, and, and uh, because of the structural displacement, it's, uh, we cannot uh, uh, trace it uh, further to, uh, to the left. And so we have white mica that uh, is more aluminium rich towards the contact with the chert. Um, the section above the fault zone contains aluminium rich white mica, and the se section above the fault zone is a separate domain. Um, well, where we looked at these, these stro stromatolite units, you know, we saw a complex uh, uh, relationship with, with veins, uh, silica-rich veins. Uh, there were also tramavic dikes going through it. Um, yeah, in, in order to really understand the relationship between the stromatolite bearing unit and the underlying foot wall and the processes that occurred in there, um, it is advised to to do detailed mapping yeah, of all the structures and relationships along this, uh, in this foot wall and, and along this, uh, this trumpet light bearing unit. Um, because it's all quite complicated and we didn't have time to, uh, to sort all that, that out. But we can see that, say that there's also a low sulfidation assemblage that is associated with the trumpet light bearing unit. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is uh, basically what, what we found yeah, in area A in association with shear zones. Uh, it's interesting because there it is near the, the Shark Gully gold deposit. So yeah, the, these minerals probably have a relationship to, to ore forming processes where gold was formed. Um, 
also in section in area B, well, I haven't showed it in this presentation, uh, but we find uh, shear zones and no paleo surfaces. In area C, we found paleo, sur paleo surface and um, early life environments yeah, because we found stromatolites there. Um, and in area D, the concentric textures, yeah, we don't, we now think they are abiotic, but there is an, a paleo surface and uh, we find these yeah, chalcedonic uh, uh, veins which are uh, associated with uh, aluminium rich white micas. Um, what is also interesting is here uh, how higher in the sequence where well, we haven't uh, done any field follow-up um, there are banded iron formations uh, yeah, containing iron ore and they are associated spatially associated with these cyan colored uh, pixels here yeah, with pyrophyllite so um, if there is indeed a an, uh, an, uh, genetic relationship then uh, maybe there is an, an hydrothermal component in the in the deposition of uh, of the banded iron uh, formation, which is interesting. Yeah, so uh, here on the right, uh, you can see a summary of uh, of our observations uh, based on the uh, the hyperspectral uh, data interpretation and field follow up. Um, yeah, I don't have to go through all uh, that in uh, in detail. Um, because most of it we have already uh, discussed. Well, what, in, what is interesting is that we find pyrophyllite in the shear zones near uh, near field uh, follow-up area A. Yeah, and then the question is, are they associated or somehow related to um, pyrophyllite higher up in the sequence? Um, and the deposition of the banded iron formations. And, and one of the things that uh, uh, that could explain the occurrence of pyrophyllite is that it is related to uh, an intrusion of uh, um, of granitoid uh, rock um, and that provided uh, magmatic fluids and that uh, that caused uh, fluid rock interactions um, in this in this greenstone belt so um, and that's also interesting in terms of uh, uh, geochronology yeah, so when when did this occur and can we find an, um, a relationship with the timing of the uh, of the intrusion um, that, that are outcropping in, in in other parts uh, in the area okay um, right some conclusions uh, based on this work uh, hyperspectral or well, the airborne hyperspectral imagery shows abundant alteration minerals in the greenstone belt of interest yeah, that is something that has been overlooked in the past yeah, because you really need infrared spectroscopy to, to see yeah, the, the spatial ex extent um, of the different types of, of alteration minerals. Um, yeah, we have found multiple events and overprinting of alteration minerals. A uh, complicated relationship. And we, we're looking at the Paleoarchean, uh, where uh, the, the geothermal gradients were probably higher. Um, processes were slightly different than, than nowadays and um, well at least yeah there's abundant uh, um, interaction with, with hydrothermal or magmatic fluids and, and rock um, yeah it, it's clear that uh, field follow-up is a requirement for solving ambiguities in the interpretation yeah so we we can see uh, we can make mineral maps but even those mineral maps we have to check in the field because uh, because of the, uh, the the mixtures that uh, that we find, especially in the iron and magnesium rich uh, rocks. But also, whenever a mineral map is uh, based on airborne data, yeah, and we can then can really uh, pinpoint uh, the different minerals. Still, you have to. Uh, visit the field to see what the, the occurrence of a particular mineral actually means. Yeah? So what are the relationships in the field? Um, what are we basically looking at? What kind of processes? Yeah? Are we just looking at uh, um, shear zones or are we looking at the paleo surface, for instance? 
Uh, and a, a fourth conclusion is the foot wolf's stromatolite bearing unit has a typical spectral signature, you know, which is uh, aluminium rich white mica altered. You know, we can talk about low sulfidation assemblages and uh, uh, multiple dikes and, uh, and veins uh, occur associated with it, which need to be further sorted out. Okay, um, yeah, this research have been, uh, has been possible because of the contributions of Brian Bennett, uh, Atlas Iron, and uh, the Dr. Schuurman funds. Okay, so thank you uh, for listening, and um, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial or presentation, and uh, perhaps uh, we see each other in another video. Goodbye. Time for some coffee now.